so today we'll be going through this passage dancing and time it's on rachel Bel- bespalov a ukrainian french philosopher and her work and her life story shortly after rachel bespalov suicide in 1949 her friend jean wall published fragments from her unfi- fi- final unfinished project the instant and freedom contains themes that occupied the ukrainian french philosopher throughout her life music rhythm corporeality movement and time one of Bespalov's key idea, the instant, is less a fragment of duration than a life-changing event, a moment of embodied mot- metamorphosis. In the midst of a noisy world torn between transience and eternity, the human being listens to the sound of history. Had she completed and published it, the instant and freedom might have become the masterpiece of an early existentialist thinker. Instead, her name is hardly mentioned today. So, a brief introduction into the work of Rachel Bespalov, like, her like how her work like inst- the instant and freedom was left uncomplete by her suicide and her ideas of the instant which is a single life-changing moment rather than a short instant of time yet Bespalov was a brilliant and original thinker among the first wave of existentialists in france albert camus john paul sartre and gabriel marcel all admired her a professional dancer and choreographer, she had fine-tuned ears for the musicality of philosophical writing. So we can see that she was into these two studies and disciplines, musical uh, musical discipline and as well as philosophical, and sought to find something in the intersection of the two. For Bespal of philosophy is a dynamic, sensual activity of listening to and engaging with voices of others, including those long dead. In a dialogue with Homer, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche and Heidegger, she found her own voice. At the heart of Bespalov's world is an original conception of time shaped by embodiment and music. The instant is a silent pause that suspends history's repetitive rhythm. Through our bodies, we experience that break from history as a brief moment of freedom. So this shows some of our followers, our, some of our contemporaries and how and some brief idea about our philosophical outlook. Her famous contemporary Simon Weil also used her b- body to express her philosophy. Weil eventually starved to death, starved herself to death in solidarity with friends and compatriots in the occupied France. Bespalov shared Weil's interest in attention, listening, and waiting as mystical practices for the body. For both thinkers, philosophy was an ex- existential embodiment of their ideas. So this shows, like unlike other philosophers, they were much more rooted in reality and they did not seek some form of detachment right so they philosophy was an existential embodiment of their idea so they were much more drawn to the corporeal much more drawn to the body as a study of philosophy however Bespalov did not use her body as a weapon against itself rather she was interested in dance as a creative alchemy of movement her philosophy of the body is closely linked to the experience of time, it is embodied day-to-day existence that measures and gives rhythm to time. So time was a very important element. In an essay of Homer's Iliad written during the Second World War, Bespalov captured the experience of living through the horrors of exile and war. The human being, bound to her time by disorder and misfortune, acquires a new perception of time of her own existence. So, like, the things you will or, sh- or go through mold your experiences, your perspectives on various things, right? And the people who went through the disorder and misfortune of war uh, developed a new perspective that was very unique to that period of time or period of existence. Bespalov's own life was one of repeated displacement. She moved from Ukraine to Switzerland, Paris to southern France, to Mount Holyoke via New York. Uh, born in 1895 in Nova Zagora in Bulgaria to a Ukrainian Jewish family, she spent her childhood in Kiev and then in Geneva where her where the family moved in 1897. Her mother, Deborah Palmater, was a philosophy, philosopher who tra- taught at a university. Her father, Daniel Pasmanik, a surgeon, became a leading theoretic- theoretician of Zionism in the Russian Empire. His father was also anti-Bolshevik and fought for the White Army in, for the Russian Civil War. So a relative ba- background was provided where both parents were intel- were involved in some case in involved in some way or the other in some kind of in intellectual activity in switzerland bespalov studied piano and composition at the conservatory philosophy at the university and eurythmics with emil jack 
dal cross these three areas of study are all intertwined in an existential philosophy of embodiment so this gives a background of how her thoughts or how our philosophy evolved later in life right so tra- training of all kind having very intellectual parents who had some kind of intellectual background was very Im- important for her background the alkazi eurythmics is a holistic method of music education it turns the body into an instrument different temporalities are concretized through movement arm gestures and steps uh, eurythmics has become an intimate practice of listening with the entire body uh, darkos's favorite student she was sent to work in paris in early 1990 she began teaching eurythmics at the paris opera while also publishing short texts on dance vespers plastic dance aimed to create a restore a lost dynamism her method attracted the attention of john cocteau and sergey diaghilev who introduced this new corporeality to ballet's ruses so we can see the definite uh, impact of how she learned eurythmics how she carried herself and had impact on different kinds of work later on right if philosophy sharpened her ears eurythmics sculpted her body towards an embodied experiments of temporality so again coming back to the point her philosophy was not something very detached from the body detached from the world she was not thinking about very uh, very non bodily or non materialistic things right she uh, like being grounded in reality being grounded to the corporeal entities she could have an embodied experience of time itself and this was also done through various ways like uh, movement and working with time like dance and eurythmics is something which is very has been mentioned in this case right she believed that a more authentic sense of time lost in modern modernity still lurked beneath our skin in 1921 she was the choreographer of royal hunt scene in hector berlioz's opera the trojans a theme she would return in her iliad essay dance and eurythmics she wrote that dance is a universe with vocabulary a fixed language a own logic and its needs eurythmics is the system of this universe turning movements into existential experiences through the plasticity of our bodies we can reach new forms of being in the fragment the dialectic of the instant basel of describes time consciousness as nothing other than certain way of grasping the relationship between finitude and infinity in the instant so a great explanation uh Oh, like this is shows her like understanding of dance how dance can be very uh, like important to philosophy right movement of the body movement of the plastic body in this case as is mentioned like has a great relationship with time and the relationship and eurythmics also and eurythmics also plays a greater part as it helps us understanding the relation between what what's finite and what's not so a great understanding through that single line The instant's brevity points us towards a lost continuity that can be restored through music and dance. Basel of discovered what she calls the experience of magic interiority. By externalizing movement, the subject of eurythmics plunges herself into an inner experience. She met her second important teacher in 1925, the Jewish existentialist philosopher Lev Shestow. The encounter with Shestow changed her life. The choreographer decided to become a philosopher. So. like we now move on to the like the philosophical evolve evolution part of vespalov this was a radical move but by then she had already married ukrainian businessman which allowed her to qu- quit her job at the opera and have a daughter sister was a central figure in the philosophical emigre circles of interwar paris french existentialism gained fame much later through the works of sartre and camus however sartre was deeply indebted to sister's original synthesis of niets karkegard dos dostovsky and jewish theology so shestov uh, comes into the picture and a lot of shestov's uh, work has been mentioned and how he was very influence in influential as a french existentialist has been mentioned shestov's charisma and unsystematic thought magnetized young philosophers among them george batai In many ways, Shestov circle was the hotbed of French existentialism. So he was kind of the pioneer of French existentialism, along with Romanian poet Benjamin Fondren. Vespalov was the at the center of Shestov salon. While her friend Daniel Halvy uh, described her sitting on Shestov sofa completely motionless while she reasoned with her whole person, with her 
hands with her lips and with her eyes so this kind of captures the the st- strength by which she was like drawn towards Shostov's intellect or Shostov's philosophy one of the few women in the circle she soon became friends with the christian exist- existentialist writer gabriel marcel and the jesuit theologian gaston fessard who both admired her work a female philosopher in the 1930s was as oliver salazar ferrer put it a bit like a woman in the 19th century wearing men's clothes however bespella would soon wear her own clothes in 1929 she had a dinner with edmund husserl was phenomenology she got con- she confidently attacked with shostovian arguments so this proved that she had some kind of understanding and philosophy of her of her own and this created a very unique identity for her bespell of course dana star with the publication of her on heidegger in la revue philosophique in 1933 it was among the very first discussion of martin heidegger's thought in france fluent in german she had read heidegger's being and time in summer of 1932 his great heidegger's greatness she wrote was that his situation itself in the next to cable he does not want to de- detach himself much like uh, vespalov's understanding of philosophy through the body like she was very attached to the body attached to the reality attached to the ground right not something very idealistic not detaching from the materialistic same similar to the experience of eurythmics heidegger's philosophy proposes our hopeless entanglement with the world it's not difficult to imagine a 28 year old sartre being drawn to bespalov's letter when she wrote excitedly existence projects itself into the possible choice is destiny so existence projects it- itself into the possible and choice is destiny so this was a, like this is a great line like uh, denoting that choice is not something denoting free will like for bespalov of interpreting heidegger choice is not a matter of free will but of is a workable commitment choice can be misunderstood to be the product of free will but it's not so choice is something we have to like it is like it's as certain as death like everyone has to make choices by actively choosing we dash beyond ourselves into an uncertain future as a musician bespal of listen to heidegger's text as if performance of a back of bach and a monumental art of fugue Uh, she recognized that as baroque fugue all the motives bring us back to the central thing of being taken up in all of its possible aspects with increasing infinite variation always identical to itself her enthusiasm for heidegger's musical metaphysics was soon tempered by the discovery of another existentialist soren kierkegaard so uh, we can see that her training in music and her like finding something common in the intersection of music and philosophy is very pronounced in this uh, like excerpt in 1934 she published notes on kierkegaard's repetition a work that emphasized the musicality of repetition and continuous transformations so these two topics were something that caught her uh, attention and she published notes on them repetitions do not add anything it only accentuates what is irreducible to human existence repetition is kierkegaard is the will to live again and the refusal to survive only by repeating can we become authentic subjects in kierkegaard's beautiful moment bespell of words found what she called the instant so through each through each teacher or each stuff she goes through we can see where she found the inspiration and where she created her own kind of philosophy right So in Kierkegaard's beautiful moment, she found the instant in case of Heidegger's text. She found the intersection of music and philosophy. So these are some of the ways we can see how her philosophy evolved. Only by uh, so this part is done. The absence of a path she wrote on Kierkegaard is the is the only path his philosophy wants to follow. This Zen-like image also perfectly captures the meaning meandering trajectories of her own thought, which Laura Sano has called nomadic. A wandering co- cosmopolitan Bespalov was forced to traverse the boundaries of various countries, languages, and cultures. Her philosophy mirrored that of nomadism, with sub- subtle attention to the embodied experience of movement, melody, and metamorphosis. So her life and her philosophy was termed to be nomadic, both because she was moving he- uh, through various cities because of various consequences, and also 
like her philosophy was not set on something very definite it was in a intersection of movement melody metamorphosis and all this stuff best part of essay collection paths and crossroads appeared in 1938 dedicated to set up the book includes text on julian green and a mallo marshall and two essays on care guard the chapter set up before near the declares a war on a teacher's total denial of possibility of a truth by refusing to think she writes Shostov had returned to another dogma a radical relativism that ultimately turned into nihilism so uh, on the uh, on this book uh, bespalov went directly against her mentor shostov and tried to prove his views against thinking or, or the possibility of truth so in some way she kind of rejected the idea of nihilism against test of rejection of reason beswala poses nietzsche's attempt to reach truth through and within one's life nietzsche's concept of will of will to truth she thought could reconcile us to the tragedy of existence where test of saw an unbridgeable gap beswala made a leap beswala's happy consciousness made a deep impression of camus who read the book closely in summer of 1939 so we can see that beswala's ideas and like rebuttals to to philosophers philosophies even of her own teacher has great impact on other people like camus beswala's writing on care in the spring of 1938 beswala began reading the iliad with her daughter naomi her extensive notes turned into brilliant essay on the homer's epic poem rest of death that year deeply upset her in a letter to wall she recalls rest of one of the truly truly noble men she knew The family moved into her husband estate in southern France 1939 just before the Nazis occupied Paris she lo- wrote a letter to Marcel but the worse it gets the more i realize you can't love life the more i discover the urgent need to find new reasons to love it and i'm afraid that this time i won't be able to which would be worse than death so we can see a negative undertone coming in and she was uh, very like like looking for sh- why if we need to love life and some kind of nihilism was indeed creeping in her work on the iliad essay became an existential method of facing the war she soon become aware of the similar text written coincidentally that appeared in cahiers de sun du sun in 1940 wales the iliad or poem of force vespala began to revise her essay she criti- critically responded <laughs> to wales condemnation of any force living as a jew in which he france bespalof became increasingly desperate with good reason in november 1941 she wrote to marcel i feel as if i'm stuck in sad restless restless absurd dream i am i'm very afraid of waking up her friend wall also jews had been imprisoned and tortured by the gestapo and the worst was to come for many jews in paris so there were some coincidences in her notes on the iliad and of also like the work that appeared in kayas do soon and she was also like we can see the darker undertones increasing in her life as like she did not want sometimes wanted to uh, she was very afraid of waking up and like the world situation was may, impacting her a lot like the world war was going on and it was very bad for jewish people to stay in paris which had been like taken by the nazis In 1942, Bespalo managed to escape, boarding one of the last ships to leave Nazi-occupied France with her mother and daughter, her library and grand piano. Having narrowly fled a concentration camp outside of, outside of Paris, Wall joined them. With his encouragement, Bespalo work began to rework her essay in the Iliad. She finished eventually finished her notes in yet another exile in New York, published in English translation in 1943 on the Iliad, framed. war was an absolute question of losing it all to gain it all in the words of fondness letter to his wife war became the movement to live our existential philosophy according to bespal of homer felt both intense love and uh, intense horror of war where whale claimed that force transformed subjects into objects bespal of emphasizes brief moments of beauty that occur in the midst of violence with with war being waged all around there are flashing instances of generosity and grace so again we can see that uh, like being grounded in reality and being grounded uh, with the being has 
like it can be clearly seen here most people would despise war as something very as something being immoral or very bad but that is a very idealistic view of war and it's not always possible to avoid it right so the interpretation of war being both beautiful and violent and bad at the same time is something very like indicative of that philosophy and there are like with war being waste dollar there are flashing instances of both generosity and grace in the Iliad, force is both a supreme reality and an illusion. It's super, it is the superabundance of life itself. A murderous lightning stroke in which calculation, chance, power seem to fuse in a single element to defy man's fate. Uh, this does not mean best of glorified violence. So, just because war was see, seen from a different perspective other than being negative, this does not mean she glorified violence. Far from it. But the experience of the Second World War made her realize the inescapability of force and its power to transform the individual's understanding of the human predicament. So she, it had a great effect on him of how it is difficult to escape force and how the, like it can change someone's life and predicament as a whole. At the heart of her essay is a Hector, a resistance hero who embodied justice and courage. Just like every human in the Iliad, Hector cannot flee his fate and he knows it. Uh, so uh, idea of fate has been like pointed out hector's flight from force is short but as the eternity of a nightmare uh, that is horrifying temporality of war best well of experience firsthand so she went through that instance as she mentioned the metamorphosizing period of time herself then that was the war and that helped her to understand the temporality or uh, the time aspect of the war going through and like some of the inescapable stuff going in the war right like we cannot escape our fate and whatever time we try to run away from it is like like eternity is like the eternity of a nightmare knowing that we need to go back to what has to happen to us while choosing to ignore it something very like last for the eternity of nightmare the most crushing part of uh, best part of celia essay are dedicated to helen a woman of Woman with whom she clearly identifies, clothed in long white veils, is the most austere character of Hemar's poem. Both unbearably beautiful and unfortunate, however, Helen awoke in exile and felt nothing but dull disgust for shrivel ecstasy that has outlived their hope. She is the prisoner of her own passivity, forced to live in horror on herself. Ultimately, Helen's promise of freedom, like Best Fellow's own, remains unfulfilled. Helplessly, she watches the men who went for war for her, observing the change of rhythm of battle. The breaks that interrupt the fight are rare instances of silence. So a account has been given how she clearly related with Helen a lot. While in New York, she preserved her ties to the Parisian intellectual life from her exile by exchanging letters. She got the job of a job with the Voice of America's French broadcast before moving to moving to Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, where she taught French literature. Mount Holyoke became a important outpost for French culture in the U.S. during the war. At gatherings of exiled scholars organized by Wall, Bespal of Maid, Jax Martian, Maritain, Andre Mason, Mark Chagall, and Claude Levi Strauss. Uh, this small dark lady who wore white gloves as a translator, McCarthy described, also made an impression of Hannah Arendt, who visited in August 1944 to deliver a lecture on Franz Kafka. So, this kind of shows her later in life uh, influences and work. Like, she moved to New York from Europe. And had still had connections with the Parisian uh, existentialism and intellectual life with letters. She met newer scholars in America and worked with them and had great impressions on them, like Arendt. Arendt's reading of Kafka, later published in Partisan Review, echoed Baspelov's existential despair. So there's a clear impression of, we can see that they like Baspelov had a clear impression on Arendt. Under the dark shadow of war, Aaron describes humanity as inescapable, trapped in history's meshes. Kafka's nightmare of the world had become a reality. In an essay, Camus, a last published work, Beswellov describes how uh, history forced her generation to live in a climate of violent death. So the despair part is being very truthfully termed. After the work, despised previously having been fated by them, Beswellov became a vocal critic of the new generation of French existentialists, especially Chartres. In 1946, to the musicologist Boris Deslosier, 
Bespel have wrote that the hollowness of subjectivity that Sartre opposes to what I call magical integrity is much less of the foundation of humanism than the harbinger of new conformity. Uh, so he she became a very vocal critic of Sartre's philosophy in some aspect. She argued that li- instead of liberating the individual, Sartre's existentialism destroyed the magical integrity through which humans can authentically connect with another. So she pointed out that Sartre's philosophy was not uh, something that was liberating or giving free will or uh, giving the individual th- food for thought, right? It was something that was very not very constructive in nature and it was not something to uh, people could easily connect to. And they degraded the subject into, a, into an object under the gaze of the other, this objectified. Subjectivity curiously aligns with American individualism. Uh, which unleashes itself in action, the mar- in action to mark the absence of the individual, like Helen Tra, the user, US felt both dull and hostile to best follow. So, uh, like telling about the uh, corporeal and body was not uh, the both did the same thing, but it, Sartre Sartre didn't do it did not do it in the same way, right? He pointed out individualism and in the sense that everyone was different from other and could not connect with it, each other. And this created, as in a sense, a society similar to the U.S. at that stage, where w- everyone was different and no, like there was no cooperation and unity between people, and it was something very hostile to Bespalov. She instead wanted uh, to be grounded in reality and grounded in the body, but not as a form of very ho- hostile individualism. She wanted individualism, individualism to shine through and help in transcendence, transcendence rather than being very closed off people in, like in the US. So it felt both dull and hostile to Bespalov. Bespalov's journey to Mount Holyoke was a final exile during term break 1949 for reasons not clearly known. She sealed her kitchen doors and turned the gas oven. Her own complex fugue ended with a tragic cadence. She had written earlier of the happiness that can be found in an instance. And it was clearly she like she kind of went against her own philosophy, we can say. In her final note, alluding to Camus's claim, she wrote, "One can imagine Sisyphus happy, but joy is forever out of his reach." And this, like, proves the statement I made earlier. I mean, it disproves the statement I made earlier. Like, you can be happy for a fleeting second or sense. <coughs> Thing uh, happy is mu- uh, much shallower emotion as pointed, like rather than joy, right? You can be happy in various working situations, in various like, difficult situations, but joy is something much more deep. It's something much more eternal. And so Sisyphus, going through the Herculean task every day, can feel happy doing the task, but joy is something he can't think of and he can't like, ever get. So a great passage on how uh, of philosophy was molded, how she... and the conclusion and how she went against people, how she was molded by different philosophies, different philosophies and how she had impact on different philosophies, how the world picture also molded it. So a great picture, great, a great passage overall.